Six awesome. hours later, the rubber gloves out my arse. I'm on my holiday. It's fine. <laughs> Welcome to Get Shirty, the podcast that likes to look at the little things in life which never fail to irritate. Each episode, we ask our special guest to talk about what gets them shirty at home, work, and going out. Then our off-the-cuff surprise question could take the chat anywhere. Each guest also designs their own made-to-measure shirt, which we then make. So we talk about that too. Funny that, us being tailors. Welcome to episode four of the second season of the Get Shirty podcast. If you haven't listened before, we are delighted to have you with us. And why not go back and listen to a few of the previous episodes? We've had guests like Adam Buxton, the one and only little Alex Horn, fellow podcaster and actor Mike Fenton Stevens and star of stage and screen Sarah Moyle. Today, though, you find us in conversation with writer, presenter and stage and TV magician Paul Zenon. Paul has been an entertainer for over 40 years, starting off in Blackpool, working in magic shops, and he really doesn't look old enough to have had a career that long. Uh, it must be something in the magic that he does. We met up with Paul in his hometown of Brighton, so it was another trip out for the podcast, which was nice, and we talked about his career, TV shows, and of course what makes him get all shirty. Here we go then. One guest, two mics, Only two tailors this time, and a host of irritations. Let's get shirty. Paul, welcome to the Get Shirty podcast. Thank you. So good to be here in my house. Yeah, well, it is. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for letting us invade your your house. Yeah, more than welcome. Yeah, well, it's nice. It's nice to be down in Brighton. Actually, don't sort of spend enough enough time here really sure enough used to back in the day but yeah not, not Trafalgar Street you were weren't it Trafalgar Street yes yeah. so I was I was indeed yeah back in the day many, many moons ago which is in fact when we first met um was, yeah. was around that time I said that like we meet each other all the time <laughs> oh you know and yes, then, been, then the long was, drinking career started when then. was the last time 1959 <laughs> yeah. I think was the last time yeah so that was the one time before now that we've met was was back yeah. then. But um, near, near the uh, Prince Albert pub, famous pub. Yeah, uh, it's got the uh, the Banksy on the side of it with the, the kissing, kissing policeman. So, have you always been sort of a Brighton? No, I've been here a long time. Been here since um, eighty seven. All right, I got here just before the the, uh, the hurricane. All right, and uh, but I'm, I'm I'm now the oldest person in Brighton officially. <laughs> <laughs> is that that's now your your official title yeah, yeah actually I, I said that have you always been brighton but I, having a sort of read up as well you obviously spent time growing up in blackpool is there a that's magic right, shop yeah. that you worked in yeah absolutely um it's called the house of secrets yeah and so uh 1818 the promenade telephone blackpool 20902 wow um and i, I worked there for uh, i think it was about five um, summer seasons uh, you know, through the school holidays, uh, from being about, I was about 13 years old, something like that. So did you love um, magic before you worked there, or was it working there that made, made you go? It, it was a bit of I both. I was already into magic, but I was, I was really into the kind of jokes and novelties kind of stuff. So what, they, what they was your favourite? Uh, well, I've, funny enough, I've, uh, last year I just did a show all about the guy who invented... Uh, X-ray specs and sea monkeys. Right, yeah. um, but uh, but originally it was just anything practical, joke-wise, you know. Yeah. And Blackpool had all these kind of, uh, I suppose you call them novelty shops or trick shops, yeah. where you could buy anything from a, a model of Blackpool Tower made out of seashells or yeah. one of those pens with a, a lady in a bikini. Yeah. And you tip it upside down and yeah. it drops off. Um, good good playground currency. Yeah, was. yeah, it really was. Um, so I was into all that, and then, and then you know, Blackpool had uh, this Paul Clive's Magic Shop on the on the North Pier. That was the first place I went. There was Murray's Magic Mart, right. uh, which was run by an old guy who was a, an Australian escapologist who'd been pretty famous in his day, right. and he'd worked in like um, something like ninety two different countries. Wow. Um, so I, I met him as a when I was about eleven. Um, ended up doing some odd, odd jobs at his house and looking through his scrapbooks, and that, that was really kind of magical, you know. Yeah. Um, but then this new place opened, the House of Secrets, and it was run by a guy called Bill Thompson, 
and uh, he looked like Tom Baker when he was doing Doctor Who. Right. Uh, originally a scouser, and uh, he became sort of my friend and mentor. You know, so I kind of learned learned the trade while while working in the shop. Um, and so in the evenings, I was doing kind of shows in in guest houses, B and Bs. And the rest of it, and then working about eleven hours a day in the uh, in the wow. shop because the illuminations it used to stay up until kind of ten or eleven at night. You know? Right. Um, yeah. So that was the real real training ground. Yeah. You know? So so I've still got um, a lot of connections with Blackpool. I've been um, working on a thing uh, called Showtown, which is a new um, it's a, it's a museum, but that always makes you think of kind of dusty old cases and fossils and things. Yeah. Uh, it's very much a kind of sort of interactive family thing. Yeah, I used to go, because uh, I sort of lived in various places around there when, when I was younger, or sort of before the age of 10, so it used to be our day trip place, or we'd sure. go and get chips, get in the car, drive down, see the illuminations, sure. and, yeah. and that, all of that. Funnily funny enough, I, I bought some Blackpool illuminations um, the other year, um, was it uh, last year I think it was, um, but yeah, I'd just been working on the Showtown thing, and I, I stopped off the way back, and I saw some actual big lights uh, on eBay of right. all things, and so I bought them, and it was it was like the reverse of the um, Spinal Tap thing. I, <laughs> I didn't realise how big they were. <laughs> so oh, I, get, I love and that. I'd seen the photographs of them next to each other, so there's nothing, you know, there's no sense of scale with yeah. them really. And it did have the measurements, which I should have kind of read, but I kind of went yeah, in. They don't mean anything. Uh, and I picked them up them. from uh, from Guildford with a van that was only just big enough um oh. but uh, so i've just got rid of two of them because i think <laughs> i'm not really uh, one of them was a um an aloha sign that was like a hawaiian theme right. thing so I'm, I'm making a tiki bar at the moment i thought oh that'd be perfect for that then realized that it would basically touch both walls oh, yeah. you know this thing it and would I be, be the bar yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. i wouldn't be able to see out the window <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh i've moved a couple of those on but um but yeah so you know, blackpool's been a, a common thread through my life really yeah, yeah. it's a, a common it, being the operative word <laughs> <laughs> but uh, do you know I, I well like you i always had really fond memories of it it was, it was always as a kid it was a magical place you know yeah. there, there was no sort of uh we, i suppose even back then there were bits of it that, that perhaps weren't as magical as uh, as others but it was just lights yeah and chips well, it, it was it, literally yeah. the bright lights you know yeah. I, I was from a kind of like small an industrial village about 50 miles away and so right. that, that was the place where you could you know the only place where you could see the, the people you'd seen on the telly yeah you know yeah. i mean it, it, it's got three piers there each uh, each of which had a theater at the end then you've got the grand theater you've got the winter gardens the opera house yeah so there's you know there's, there's probably over 10,000 seats in in yeah. venues in blackpool you know so you know, i'd go and see freddie star and uh danny larue danny and LaRue. Uh, the Grumbleweeds and oh wow all yeah. that sort of stuff and uh, funny enough last year i ended up doing a, a little tour called legends of variety and the Grumbleweeds are on that were they um, along with bernie clifton yeah um, i've, I've met way. him once yeah a lovely bloke actually yeah. I, did, I, did, I did a kids series with him in 1991 i think it was Right. Uh, and that was a lot of fun, so we were kind of chewing the fat about that. Right. Uh, there was uh, Anita Harris yeah. uh, on it, who I ended up doing Panto with last year. But it was called Legends of Variety, and it was organised by... Do you remember Freddie Parrotface Davis? Yeah, yeah, he had uh, the bowler hat. Yeah. It was, pushed uh, sort of down over I think his it was eyes. A, a Homburg, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, And yeah, he used to do that. Uh, I'm a pick, pick, pick up yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. You know, Samuel yeah. Tweet was the character name. Right. Well, he was the producer of this show and, right. and uh, an MC'd it at odd time as well. And he, he called me up about doing it and he said, uh, he said, now, we can't have you on the posters uh, as a legend because uh, you're not old enough. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it, and so it ended up uh, on, on the billing. It was, you know, the Legends of Variety and all the names there. And then it was me and a guy called John Courtney who, who won um, Britain's Got Talent a couple of years ago. And and they had us as, as new stars of variety. Right. <laughs> so so yeah, I age fifty nine at that point. You, I, I was the new kid on the yeah, block. You know? Yeah. <laughs> You're suddenly just breaking through. Yeah. Oh. So presumably you've you've played Blackpool yourself. Yeah. yeah quite and a, how did that feel going back and, being, yeah, and well, performing there? It, it was great actually. Um, I did a, a show a few years back called Linkin Rings, which was um, a, a bit of a, a, a change, a, a bit of a departure for me. Style wise, because it was a it was a play, a, a kind of monologue, and quite serious and quite sort of poignant. And it was about growing up in Blackpool, and it's about working in the House of Secrets and and uh, my mentor, but also a story about Houdini. And it was the, the Linking Rings thing refers to these overlapping. 
parallel lives kind of thing. Right. And so I did. I did that. Um, I did it up in Edinburgh. Did it in the West End. Did it up there, you know, a few other places. Uh, and I took it up to do the magic convention because Blackpool has this huge magic convention every year. It's the, it's the biggest one in the world. It's four thousand uh, attendees. Wow! Which is quite quite a surreal event, as you'd imagine. Yeah. Uh, and I did the Lincoln Rings show there. Um, because it was largely about this guy, by, uh, Bill, who, who died uh, 11 years ago now, um, the whole audience, well, not the whole audience, but a, a lot of them knew him personally. Yeah. And, and it's, quite a, it's quite a difficult show for me to do, because it's, it's quite personal. Um, and so I, I was kind of performing that there in a, a, a venue that was literally a couple hundred yards from the actual House of Secrets, right, where it right was. Enough. And as I'm getting towards the, this kind of particularly poignant part of it, I'm just looking out and, you know, magicians being largely male, I just see all these guys and a sea of white hankies <laughs> coming out <laughs> <laughs> everywhere. Um, so that, that was a real kind of, it felt like a homecoming, you know. We've been talking about work a little bit here, so that sort of leads us on to the first thing of the get shirty, you know. Mm. Um, as I said to you before, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a loose thing to hang the chat on really, but you know, it's, sure. it's got to be ticked off. Um, <laughs> so from a get shirty point of view, so we've talked about a lot of things you love about the job that you do. Are there any get shirties from a work point of view? Yeah, I, th I think, um, being, being introduced by the CEO or MD of, of a, at a corporate gig, that's always a, an interesting one. Although I quite enjoy it in a weird sort of way because it's <laughs> in it's a sadistic way. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's basically it's the it's the person that's paying your fee. Yeah. Who decides how they'll introduce you, and they're not usually someone who's used to being on stage. Right. And so you know they, they'll um, quite often they'll start off with your name. Yeah. And then you can see it registering in their head. They've got nowhere to go to, <laughs> from that point. Yeah. 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 So we've got the entertainment now. It's Paul's end and and. And he's going to go all the he's a lovely so, chap, yes, and, I, and I'm sure he'll be coming on at any point now. Yeah. You know? So um, yeah, quite a lot of the time. I mean, corporate events have been the sort of uh, bread and butter for me. You know, I mean, yeah. that's that's what's made the money um, compared to the comedy clubs or, or festivals or. Yeah, you know, yeah. So uh, I can't really knock them that way, but they always tend to be in a venue that's not made for entertainment with a. Uh, usually no stage, or if you get a stage, it's facing the wrong way. Yeah. Um, the the banqueting manager is the uh, natural enemy of the performer, basically. So they'll, you know, quite often they'll use the cue for you going on the stage to do the clearing of the, the main course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so just <laughs> the minute everybody needs to listen, <laughs> make as much noise as possible. Out right, you go, yeah. off you go. So as I'm walking on in my dinner suit, you've got two, you know, two dozen waiters also in uh, almost matching <laughs> dinner suits walking on. Which one's he? You know. You can build that into yeah. an illusion. <laughs> and you write your own intro. Well, I, I do now. I mean, yeah, I mean, but, it, but you, quite often they'll ignore it, you know, and, and yeah. you can't argue with them because they say they're, they're, they're paying it and they know best. Um, but yeah, there's all sorts of things on corporate things where um, you've normally got, a, if you've got a hotel sound system, um, they've usually got a you know, handheld radio microphone, but no stand for it. Yeah. And the, the, the stand is quite important as a, as a prop act. Yeah. Um, and then they'll, they'll you know, you'll, you go, well, when was the battery last changed in that? Oh, we just change it when it, when it stops working. You go, well, <laughs> well, well, that's going to be five minutes into my act, isn't it? Obviously. Yeah. Um, they, there was a, a phase in the, I think it was sort of late 80s, right through the 90s, where uh, every, everyone decorated everything with helium balloons. And so they'd quite often tie them in, uh, either in bunches on the, uh, uh, on the table weighted down, yeah. which basically blocked everyone's view of the stage, yeah. wherever you were in the room, or they'd tie them individually to the back of chairs. So yeah. I started carrying around a big pair of scissors, like decorator's scissors, um, and while my intro music was playing, I just run around the room, <laughs> cutting it off. So, so the, the the hotel managers hated me from yeah. that point of view. Cause the, I think it was the great room in um, Grosvenor House on Park Lane. Um, they, they ended up banning helium balloons right. there, and it's because it's such a high ceiling, and, and inevitably some joker set them off if it wasn't me. Someone else would let them yeah. go, and the only way they could get them down was with an air rifle. Oh. Um, and because they're uh, like the foil balloons would still take a couple of days to come down even with a hole in them because oh. you know they're just kind of quite yeah. quite uh, solid um, so th that was another pain but yeah just corporate gigs corporate in general gigs. Uh, and you know quite often they've got a free bar 
uh, for several hours before you go on. Yeah. Um, you're at the end of the meal when everybody just wants to chat up their mate's secretary or whatever. Yeah. They don't want to watch entertainment. They don't know who you are. But I did one for uh, Cider years ago. And it was the, the, the point where they were, it was at Alton Towers and they had a massive marquee. And it was the point, the point of the conference was they were telling them for the first time that 50% of the workforce were going to be made redundant uh, in, in the next six months. Uh, but, but didn't tell them which 50%. Yeah. So basically, they, they, um, you know, they had the, the morning kind of conference part. So they're all kind of, you know, <laughs> crying into yeah. their, uh, their coffee. Uh, then they gave them free run of the park in the afternoon. And then from 4 p.m., a free bar. Oh. And then myself and a comedian called Boothby Graffo with the, with the entertainment in the evening. And we arrived... Hold that thought. So yeah. We arrived. The following is an announcement on behalf of a certain tailor based in Tunbridge Wells. Have you visited Hardman and Hemming online lately? No? Well, you should. They have a new sparkly website, which tells you all about what they do and how they do it. There are examples of their work, blogs on how to look after suits, details of the services they offer, and not to mention all of the Get Shirty podcasts with additional pictures. But best of all, you can find details of the H&H &H Shirt Club. The shirt subscription service where a tailored shirt of your design will be delivered to your door as often as you choose. You even get one shirt free once you sign up. Not to be missed, so do pop along and go to hardmanandhemming.co.uk and sign up today. And remember, the first rule of Shirt Club is tell everyone about Shirt Club. That concludes our public announcement. So we arrived uh, about four o'clock, right. um, and that's when the official free bar was supposed to start. But they'd actually been drinking the stock. It was one of those little plastic yeah, uh, things yeah. with a foil top, right? Um, and it was you know this uh, what was it um, crab apple flavour and all yeah, these awful there was things. like an aniseedy one. Yeah. There, there was a blue and a red. I yeah. seem to remember. Yeah, and, and the gimmick was that the bottom of it was kind of like a, almost like a Lego brick, so you could stack them. Right. And so we arrived and we could hear this kind of chanting from a distance. So we stuck our head in the marquee and basically all the tables had these pyramids of these shot glasses about four feet high oh. on the tables. And they were all kind of like, it, it, I don't know, it was like a, almost like a football, a football uh, stadium audience. Right. But with no music play at this point, just some of them singing, some of them wailing, some of them right. shouting, some of them lying on the floor. Um, and th this is kind of 4, 4.30, and we're not on till 9. Oof. And so we kind of, um, we, we sat outside and, and waited, and the, um, the MD of the com company came up to us and said, uh, you know you're down to do um, 40 minutes each. He said, yeah. He said, just do 20, 25, that'll be fine. You know, right. great, okay. So as he got nearer the time, he came out again. <laughs> And he went, yeah, just, just, you know, just do about 15, 15 minutes. That was great. <laughs> and so, so Boothie was on first, and then he had to kind of hand over to me, and I back reference him, going, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, yeah. So just before he's going on, the, M the MD comes out one last time. He went, right, we're ready to go. Just do what you can. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! And so, uh, so we kind of went on. He he died. It, it was like watching um, a, a shot of someone rehearsing in an empty room, superimposed with an audience who you know didn't have any entertainment. It was just too. Oh, so it, 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 it's like it's like being invisible when you're on there. You're just yeah. talking to a load of people facing the other way. Yeah. And so he did his you know whatever ten minutes. Um, and as he came off, I was about to go, ladies and gentlemen, he went, don't say my name, don't say my name. I really <laughs> he didn't, he did. want, to, didn't he... want anyone to know if, if they had been paying attention who he was who died that badly. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so that, that was, you know, fairly typical uh, 90s corporate. Corporate game. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So there's a comedian called uh, Mandy Knight, and uh, she was arriving kind of uh, sort of late to do the uh, second half at the comedy store. Uh, and I think it was a midnight show. They used to have kind of eight o'clock and midnight. Oh, right. And so the audience were quite 
you know, quite rowdy. Greased it, so yeah. yeah, so as she came in, there's a, a, a massive doorman there called Mark, and I mean, he's just huge. And uh, on the way in, she said, oh, I don't like this. It's Mark, can you just keep, that, that guy there particularly, you know, keeps having a go on the act, to the acts before her. Uh, he said, just, just keep an eye on it, will you? And he said, yeah, sure, Mandy. And so she goes on, and sure enough, this guy pipes up, shouts something as soon as she's walked on. And she said afterwards, I could see Mark's silhouette coming very slowly down the aisle. And then he just kind of leant down to him and sort of, you know, elbow on the shoulder and uh, whispered something. And then the, the guy just totally shut up, just kind of like, <laughs> fine. And so she said afterwards, Mark, th thanks for that. That was great. What did you say to him? And Mark said, well, I didn't say nothing, Mandy. I just bit his ear. <laughs> <laughs> Now that's a heckle stuff. That, yeah, <laughs> that really is. So, work, tick, get shirties, done. What, what about the rest, the home? So, work, rest and play, so the, the being at home or the sort of when you're on your time I off. Think, um, well, I think actually one that covers all the bases is um, the uh, frustrations of travel. Right. You know, so whether it's for work, whether it's for holidays or, or you know, okay. just for fun in general. And just everything from, you know, the, 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 the price of rail tickets to the... It's a lack of logic in everything in right. my book. You know, when a, a return ticket's cheaper than a single one and yeah. all that sort of nonsense. And um, in fact, oddly enough, yesterday I had a, an interesting travel episode. And it's, it's a bit of a weird uh, tale behind this, but I, I hired a van. And I had a, a load of hassle uh, actually picking the van up, and in the end, I had to uh, get a different one. And it was because they go to a third party company to check your address. Right. Um, so basically, I'd paid for it online, uh, and it asks for your address and all that detail uh -huh. there. Um, I'd <coughs> taken in my uh, driving license, which has got my address on, and I had two other forms of ID that had my address on. Uh, and it's, it was that. Uh, computer says no right. and I said well are you, are, you, are you saying that I don't live where I live yeah. or what and they said well where, what was your previous address and that's I gave them that I said oh we've got that one on record uh, I went for, and that, that was fine renting from there go, okay well um, can we use that then? no we can't use that because that's not your current address and it just went round yeah, and round yeah, yeah. in circles <clears throat> and in the end um, I said so what are you saying that I don't live there and I said no but this uh, third party company uh, are convinced that you don't and you're going right, and we're taking above everything yeah. else they were so in the end they, they wouldn't release the vehicle no. um, and so they ended up I'm a member of a, a, a car club uh, locally but I wasn't using that because they, they, they got mileage charges and I, I was going quite a long way and so uh, so they gave me that instead um, and that was oh. fine with an identical van and, the, and that's a, a totally separate company, apparently, the car club to the rental right. company. And so it went on that. So I set off eventually, kind of an hour late, having sorted all this. And I'd bas I was trying, I'd, I'd plugged my phone in to use as a sat nav, but I didn't have a clip to right. put it on, so it's just on the seat <clears throat> next to me. And uh, the, the, the map picture on the, uh, on the actual screen, on the, uh, you know, the dashboard, uh, suddenly cut out. Uh, and I was about 15 minutes up the road from here. And so I, uh, I picked my phone up and just pressed it, and it came back on. Uh, two minutes later, there's blue flashing light behind me, and it was an unmarked police car, I eventually right. found out. And so it pulled me in, um, and I've now got uh, six points on my license and a 200 quid fine oh. for using my phone. And so, and I, you know, I said, well, uh, yeah, it would have been more dangerous not having the yeah. map and all the rest of it. I said, just out of interest, if the phone had been on a clip in front of me, that would have been okay. And right. said, yes. Oh, okay. So um, it's just purely that you picked it. I picked, I picked, I picked it, up, it up and he happened to be overtaking me and saw it in my hand. <clears throat> and it was oh, like, you no. know, uh, a couple of seconds. And also, you know, on, on the screen, and it, it's just this lack of logic, you know. Yeah. You know so I'm fine to use the main dashboard screen and look at that and point at it, or the phone on a clip. But if I hold it up in the same position, yeah. that's illegal, and, yeah. no, and that's not even mitigating circumstances to him, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so that you know, again, that lack of logic thing. 
Yeah, that's, same, a, that's a proper git show. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's why. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then what, what he didn't realise, and I wished he'd asked now, was what was in the back of the van. Right. Uh, because I was taking, <laughs> I was taking a load of uh, a load of uh, taxidermy, um, a couple of Blackpool illuminations. Right. <laughs> And just a load of weird shit. Yeah. Basically, I was taking it up to an auction uh, near near Oxford, and I joked the night before in the pub. I joked with my mate, "Imagine getting stopped by the police with that lot." <laughs> and I, I, I'll show you afterwards. But I took a photograph of the back of the van. All so right. there's just this giant uh, rowan antelope head, uh, a full fox, oh. uh, a kind of <laughs> genius. <laughs> so on one hand, you're going, "Yes, yeah, so I got pulled over. <laughs> look, I can." Yeah. yeah, but yeah, at least if he has to look in the back, back. I, I could have got a routine out of it long term. <laughs> Um, yeah. That's it, is I'm just annoyed. Yeah. Uh, There's a certain sense of irony as well. A magician getting caught with something in his hand he shouldn't have had in there. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. You should have just It's not there. Where? 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 I, I want, you know what? I, I, I haven't told anybody publicly this before, but I once got pickpocketed in Prague. Now, that, was, that, uh, and, and that was embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, the professional embarrassment of that. Yeah, yeah. but uh, so yeah, so that was all you know, all in the space of an hour. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I think flying as well. It's just, I mean, I, I did a whole routine years back on um, uh, as a TEDx talk. Right. Um, and that was about. It was called security versus reason, and it was basically about all the airport rules. And you understand sort of why they're there. Yeah. But a lot of them really don't make sense. And, it, yeah, and yeah. that's what really frustrates me is, is the. Yeah, it's, it's the theatre of security rather yeah. than actual security. Yeah, you yeah. know, uh, have you got anything on you that can be used as a weapon? And you go, well, but, you know, my, my intelligence, <laughs> you know, my belt buckle, um, you my know, rapier uh, wit, a metal pen. Yeah. yeah, but you can't take those tweezers. Yeah, you know, yeah. So. And that liquid better be in a clear bottle because if it's in a clear bottle, I can see that it's a dangerous liquid yeah. rather than just a clear liquid. Well, that was the thing I used to say about the, um, you, you know, the, uh, the x-ray stuff has got to be put in a clear bag. Yeah. And you go, how crap is your x-ray machine? <laughs> yeah. now, that's not an x-ray machine, that's just a box with a hole in it, isn't it? You know? <laughs> yeah. And, the, and the, uh, the, the sizes, which are apparently changing, thankfully, at last. I mean, you know, not to mention the fact that there was no um, terrorist incident with liquid explosives yeah. at any point anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, apparently a foiled one, but that, you know, one's never yeah. actually happened. And they go, well, you know, why has it got to be in small bottles when you can have a total of that much? Yeah. Oh, because, well, you, you know, you could mix them together. Yeah, but you need a bigger um, receptacle for that. What, you mean like a, a litre plastic bag that they <laughs> give you for free? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Zip it up, shake it up, away you yeah. You know, yeah, the, very strange. So you remember the old uh, Esther you used to have to fill in for going to the States? Yeah. And it was a green form, and the questions on it are things like... Um, uh, have you now, uh, are you now involved or have ever been involved, been involved in espionage, sabotage or genocide? Yeah. And you go, it's a bit, bit of a loaded question when you're away at Disneyland with the kids. Yeah, right? really? Yeah, just ticking that and going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. oh they caught me out. They caught me. Yeah. It's yeah. not a great escape, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Enjoy your holiday. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Are you a spy? Yes. Oh. We once did a... Um, I think we couldn't use it in the end for a TV show, but we recorded it in an underground station in London. And I basically, it was one of the street magic specials. And I basically had about two, two and a half thousand used tube tickets on me. Right. So I had them everywhere from kind of normal pockets, tucked in my socks, tucked in my waistband everywhere. So we did it as a hidden camera thing. And I just kind of wanted to put, put this one through when it comes back as, you know, not valid. So eventually, I tried that a couple of times, then call over the guy, the, 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 um, the, the guard there. And I said, sorry, that's not going through. He said, oh, that's out of date, that one. I said, oh, right, sorry, it must be this one. And I'd bring out another. I we spent like three or four months, and I'd just bring out these handfuls, just to see at what point it does. So by the end of it, I was like knee deep <laughs> in these things. And in the end, uh, they wouldn't let us use it because it's classed as private property, and they don't have a sense of humour. Have you got a favourite trick for TV and a favourite trick? You know, what's what's your favourite? You, you know, yeah. Well, I, I kind of go. I've sort of resisted the magic question so far. Sure, you, you're yeah. going to get a barrage once we stop recording, <laughs> or I can do them now. What about, you know, I, I won't answer any secrets. Sure. But no, it's interesting because most, most people go, what's your favourite trick? But they don't distinguish between TV and live. Yeah, because there must be different different things. Very big difference there. Yeah, I mean, obviously the stuff I do live, I've, I've 
done on TV on more than one occasion. Yeah. But the one everybody seemed to talk about out of the uh, the, the street magic stuff, uh, and that's what I go by, that becomes my favourite because it's kind of remembered, right. uh, was uh, pulling a tax disc through a car windscreen. Yeah, I remember that. And yeah. it's, and I'm not sure why it was so popular. I mean, look, there'll be people listening to this go, what's a tax disc? <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course, I suppose you couldn't do yeah. that anymore, could you? No. Yeah. Um, that's why it'll be dropped from 50 yeah. Greatest Magic yeah. Tricks or whatever. Yeah, I watched that not, not so long ago. Actually. Yeah, there, there's oh, so many versions of that over the years. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was your one. Uh, yeah, no, I, I had two of them on there at one point, and they were both from the same special. And I wondered why they chose the second one, and then I found out that is because they had to pay less if they used ah. two tricks that were because uh, they added up to you know less than 90 seconds or whatever right, it was right, okay. so, um, but yeah the um, the tax disc thing I mean I think it's because it's easy to describe yeah. in a weird way because you get so you know someone like um, he whose name shall not be mentioned anymore David Copperfield uh, you get yeah, um, yeah. you get him uh, oh he made the Statue of Liberty disappear and so it kind of it it's, does what it says on the tip yeah, yeah. you know it's rather than oh he asked me to think of my mother's birthday and then times it by 10 and then I turned yeah, a sponge yeah. ball into a rabbit and the rabbit coughed up a playing card and it had that number written on it. You know, <laughs> Although it's, I it's, would it's, watch that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so yeah he pulled a, a tax disc through a windscreen yeah. it's easy to well, describe. So. And it's it's relatively, you know, it's something that we were all familiar with. And for the life of me, I, you know, I like to look at a trick and go, all oh, right, I think I can work out how that's done. Sure. Like for, for that, I can think, well, you could palm this bit, but then how do you make the bit that's in there disappear? And, sure. You know, it, so there was so many components in that. Well, well, then, so it's like, I can't, I can't even begin to get my head around. Well, do you remember that series, The, the Mass Magician? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which, which actually we recorded a, a, a bit of a piss take of that for the first Street Magic pilot, but didn't use it. Right. And I, I was the, the balaclavered magician. <laughs> <laughs> and the catchphrase was, um, uh, they say they're doing this. They're really just doing that. It's a piece of piss. <laughs> oh, so, you know, de definitely do that. I want to watch all of that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, they, uh, they nicked the, the tax disc idea. They did it with a parking permit because obviously right. they have tax disc in the, in the States. Um, but it was an entirely different method. It wasn't the oh, way right. I did it. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that was interesting. Uh, but out of the favourites of the live stuff, that's a difficult one because the, I mean, I tend to use the same openers and closers because they're the diff difficult ones to kind of come up with, you know. Everything in between, whether you're doing a 20-minute act or an hour, you can kind of vary the, all the middle section, but you still need that, you know, quick and fast opener yeah. uh, and something more substantial for the closing. And so I, I tend, I'll, I'll split between the two, but I still do the cut and restored microphone lead. And the reason I like that, I think, for live is that when I cut through the cable with a pair of wire cutters, I haven't done any magic at that point other than this. And yeah. I'm also using something that's already there on the stage. Right. So there's that moment, I think, with a lot of the audience where they go, has he actually just done that? Yeah, or, yeah. or not, you know. I used to use it later in the act, and I, and I just thought, I'll try it at the beginning. It, it, it works Word. stronger. Um, so, yeah, that's good. Although, in, in the old days, I used to like using a, a radio microphone because it gives you more mobility, uh, but no one had them. Uh, and now, what I like using a corded microphone so I can do that, do that and trick. no one has them. <laughs> <laughs> so You're well, either always ahead of the yeah, curve or yeah. just slightly. Well, all the, I was joking about it with another magician the other day. All of my live material is becoming defunct just by you know natural changes. I mean, I, I used to do a, a trick that ended up with a, a lit cigarette right. on stage. You go, right, that's, that's kind of out. Although I have got away with lighting a cigarette on stage um, pretty much every show. Right. Uh, I've, I've got a little, well, I won't give it away now, but there's nah. a, a little thing I tell people. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, don't, I, I, do a, I, I used to use a flick knife for, right. a, for a trick, and you know, with all the various incidents that have happened, you go, it's not a, a good thing anyway, but also just the possession of a flick knife is, yeah. is strictly and I suppose it probably wouldn't work quite as well with the old flick cones. Uh, no, no, yeah. although I did use one of those in the, in the show I did last That's year, it. actually, uh, as a joke shop novelty. I, just said, um, oh, I love my flick cone. Yeah. <laughs> I had all those, all of those novelty. Yeah. All of Oh yeah, I still have. I've got the, the um, drawers full of them. Yeah, we've got an attic and a. Uh, well, it's not not a spare room. It's yeah. a, in danger of undergoing gravitational collapse. The amount of crap I've got. Yeah, there. yeah, the magic. But, room. Yeah. yeah, but I mean the other uh, the other trick I finish on isn't a magic trick, and that's the weird thing. It's it's more of a well, it's a physics demonstration, but it's uh, um, it's a juggler's trick really. 
and that's balancing. It's hard to describe in audio only. Uh, it's taking a, a pool or a snooker triangle frame right. um, and balancing it on edge and standing a, a full pint of freshly poured beer inside it. And then the top corner of the triangle is attached to a dog lead. Right. Um, and then I basically spin it round upside down and then change it to a horizontal cir- um, circle and walk through the audience with it. All right. And at the end, someone lifts it off the triangle to prove it's not stuck on there, and I down it in one. All right. Um, so it's, but I think it, it is genuinely quite dangerous. Yeah, That's yeah. the thing with it. And so uh, that's the, you know, the reason I like doing live shows is because when you're in the room with someone, uh, yeah. it's got you know, far greater impact if they think they're going to get uh, a glass the smashed. Head with yeah. 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 I, think, um, I think I've seen that. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done it a few times on TV. I did it on the Comedy Store series and live at Jonglers. And yeah. Actually, yeah, I've done it several times. Like that. But I've been doing that for, God, like, it's going to be 30 years, I think. But and it, it's one of those, if I don't do it, and people know the act, oh, why didn't you do that? Do that, yeah. Uh, yeah. And if you do do it, oh, are you still doing that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah, that's, you know, um, that, th- th- those are the two live favourites. We forgot the hat. I know. Do you know? Don't. <laughs> don't. So. <laughs> well, have, have, we done so have, have we done? Have, was the travel covering the the work, rest, and play going out? Was that was that from a git shirty point of view? Have you got a going out, or is does um, travel cover it? Go, actually, going out. Well, a, a, an extra one which will cover the travel as well. Right. Except more linking rings. Yeah. Um, is just people being unself conscious and particularly with um, uh, regard to noise. Right. Um, so I mean, I, I I don't particularly like quiet quiet pubs, but I want to be able to have a conversation. Yeah. Um, so I mean, that's you know generally down to uh, young bar staff these days. I was. Sound like, Those young sound, sound like the grumpy old git I am, but I was talking the other day um, with someone and saying, I remember the days when the music in the pub was for the punters, Yeah, you know, not to entertain the bar, bar, bar staff because they were bored. Yeah. Uh, and sports screens, similarly. I'm, you yeah, know, yeah. I'm not into sports anyway, but just kind of visual distractions. Uh, I don't need to be like a, you know, a, a doctor's waiting room, but just a, a level where you can talk oh, yeah. to more than one person at once would be nice, right. you know. But also pe- people on... Uh, public transport playing stuff on their phones, yeah, you know, yeah. tinny, horrible, uh, having the conversation on your phone. You know, what was stopping you from putting that to your yeah, ear I know. to have it? You know, yeah, we, we talk about it all the time. Yeah. All the time. Do you know, I heard a theory about this. Have we talked about this on the yeah. podcast before? Yeah, I think I dismissed it. But yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, well, not the that, podcast. But you, so the theory on that is, is because essentially it's reality TV yeah. that, that's done that because where phones were being used more in things like The Apprentice mm-hmm. and X Factors, Judges Houses, and they were, right, call your mum, call this person, yeah. and they have to get the other side of the conversation. They sure. Like, put it on speakerphone. Yeah. So suddenly on TV, you had all these people holding their phones going, mum, yeah. guess what, blah, 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 oh my God. And yeah. So they stopped putting them to their ears. And of course, yeah. they, you see that on I mean, X Factor and all this. Even, allow, even allowing for that, you know, you're kind of holding it at a distance horizontally, like, like you're about, yeah. it's like you're about Just, to eat a rive eater, yeah. you know, so. Now there's a good slight of hand, turning your phone into a rive eater. But yeah, no, just put it to your ear. Yeah. Put it to your ear. I don't know yeah. why everybody else needs to hear. Yeah. That. And now with uh, Bluetooth speakers as yeah. well, I mean, especially living on Brighton down the beach, just yeah. everyone's taking their own equivalent of a boombox. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, uh, and it's always crappy music. I, I, I like quite a wide range of music. Yeah. Um, but the, it seems to, seems to be the same people that are unself conscious about playing it yeah, are the ones yeah. with extremely bad taste. <laughs> well, that, that's probably that probably is it. Yeah. Look, check me out. Check out how good my taste yeah. is when it's. Yeah. Well, what but, you need to do is an Adam Buxton. Uh, he said on the podcast, um, if he's in a pub and the music's loud where he's sitting. He just unplugs the speaker. <laughs> and like, that's the other end of being unself conscious, isn't I it? Have, so I have he done plugs that. it back in again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Very politely plugs it back I, in again. I, I did that but... in Dubai, actually. We were doing a, um, a comedy store tour thing out there. And we went on, we had a night off. So we went on the, the barge, that uh, uh, the ferry or whatever it is that goes in. So it's yeah. sunset and you've got all the kind of uh, minarets and the, you've got the Islamic call to prayer. And it's all right. really atmospheric. And they're blasting out ABBA. 
<laughs> on this thing. So I just waited until no one was looking and just yanked the wires out yeah, of the speaker nice. on it. So yeah. Oh, yeah. Public service, that yeah, was. Yeah, absolutely. Was. Stu a minute ago said, we forgot the hat. And we did forget the hat. Okay. Right, it's, so. It's leaving, it's leaving, I've probably got one. Well, it's, so, leaving, it's leaving the shop, that's what does it. Yeah, it's, it's leaving the shop, we forget things. Yeah. So I'll do the uh, explanation. Yeah, so okay. what it is, is we have a section, the last which I've mentioned to you, there'll be a, like a last section called off the cuff. It's, so basically we have a hat, mm -hmm. a bowler hat, with lots of suggestions in of things to get shirty about. Right. But it's called off the cuff, because that works with the Git Shirty. Yep. But then we couldn't work out how to get that to somebody other than pulling out of a hat. We're not very inventive like that. Mm -hmm. So now we've decided to keep the hat. Mm -hmm. But because we've left the shop, <laughs> we have left the hat. The one time we want somebody to actually pull something out of a hat and for it to have the most relevance. Because we should be in a cliche. Like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and how good would that have been yeah. if, it, if it had been like, <laughs> what we should have done is put everyone in there as rabbit. <laughs> and gone, oh my God, that's, can you imagine that? That's, that's about, um, I often get asked to do, uh, draw the raffle at charity right. events and, and stuff. And you're asking a magician. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, we can't, we can't do that off the cuff. No. out of the hat. Well, we could improvise it, and so I could pull out an invisible one out of your invisible hat. Armadillos. What we'll do is we'll cut to the shop of us dipping our hand into the, the hat, oh. pulling out a piece of paper that says armadillos. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we, you rant about whatever you want to rant about, we'll right. cut this bit. Okay. <laughs> no, we pulled out! We pulled <laughs> he was out. right, he was right, he's amazing. <laughs> he's what? the best. Let's get shirty. Phone cues. All right, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, it's, it's just quite relevant to me at the moment. Um, yeah. In that... Um, call waiting, and oh, that's not call waiting, is it? Yeah, the, the, the sort of, you are 62 in the queue, that, yes. that thing. Yeah, well, I mean, at the moment, um, I'm trying to buy uh, a place abroad. And so as part of that, I've got to set up a Greek bank account. All right. And with the, the money laundering uh, laws and all the rest of it in recent years, it's just got far, far worse than it used to be, apparently. Um, so over the past two, three weeks, I've probably spent, because I've got to get so many different things. I've got to get something from HMRC. I've got to get something from a bank over here. I've got to get something from, you know, from the passport office. Um, and I've probably spent round about 12 or 14 hours Whoa. just in queues uh, on the phone, because it's, it's the automated thing. Yeah. And now they've got the uh, voice recognition that asks you roughly what your inquiry is about. Yeah. And you, so, you know, and it's just looking for key words. Yeah. And so you go, right, it's, uh, it's about my certificate of uh, residency or for the UK. He goes, oh, would you like a letter of residency for overseas? And you go, no, no, yeah. you just recognise one word out of that, haven't you? <laughs> and so you go, oh, could you describe it again? And so you try to think of the, all these different, different ways of putting it. And in the end, uh, am I right? No! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, you're not really right. So, um, but yeah, so, it's just, and then the music. The music, oh, that's exactly what I was about uh, to say, the music. In the old days, they'd play, it'd be still rubbish music, but, 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 yeah, <laughs> but it'd be quite a long version of it. Yeah. And now, it's normally a couple of bars, it, and it's just, yeah. it's, it's like water torture. Yeah, you know, and they just, don't, and the quality's really bad yeah, as well. Yeah, totally. It's like crackling, yeah. and you, you get just one little phrase of the music. Yeah. And then and, it's background. And on the, the, the HMRC one is particularly bad. Yeah. Because um, when you finally get through, and it's been an average an hour and a quarter each time, and I finally get through to someone, and you have to describe the whole thing, and they go, all right, I'll just get someone who can deal with that. And they go yeah. to a different department. Yeah. And so then you have to go through all the same security S questions again, again. Yeah. and then describe the thing again. Yeah. And then they tell me they can't do anything about it. Or in, in several cases with them, they've sorted it, or they've apparently sorted it, and they go, that's fine, so the hard copy should be with you within a week or whatever. And then the next morning, while I'm still asleep in bed, they've left a message going, oh, there's a slight problem, can you call us back? And you go, jeez, and go through the whole thing again. The whole thing again. Meanwhile, in that hour and a quarter, besides the music loop, about every 30 seconds, uh, do you know it's much quicker uh, to go online Line, to this? Yeah. Yes, I do. That's where I got this number from. You know, this <laughs> yeah, kind of, yeah. Uh, Jack, it's the little silent pause between the music as well yeah. that I hate. The one that makes you go, <gasps> yeah, oh, no, it's not yeah, me. It's yeah. not me. Especially when you're on hold. Like, we have to be on hold at work sometimes, calling yeah. the bank or something. And so we'll be trying to do stuff, 
at yeah. the same time when it's on loudspeaker. Yeah. And so you're like, oh yeah, and of course we, we could always go and do that. Yeah. Oh no, anyway, hey, what were we saying? It's like yeah. that sort of, yeah, I, it is. I, I was describing it to my accountant the other day and, and he said, well, how do you uh, think it is for us in an accountant's company? Uh, oh, he said yeah, everywhere, because yeah. there's like six rooms in the building, yeah. and all, at least one of them at all times, times. is on that. Yeah. Yeah, so. on how, uh, why do you have to give the your account number? Beep, 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 hash. Yeah. And then give your account number when you get through. Yeah. What was yeah. The, yeah, what's your what's account number? Oh, I've already yeah. done that. Yeah. Your mother's maiden name. And, yeah, you know, yeah. Just yeah. Like, what was the point of all that? Because yeah. you clearly... From your memorable you. information, give us the uh, the third, uh, the third, fourth and eighth yeah. symbol. And like... I, I like the one where it's... I can anyway. The, they phone you about something. Yeah. The bank can go, hello, is, is that Mr... You know, yeah. uh, Mr. Zen, whatever... They uh, then go, uh, can I just ask you a couple of security questions? Yeah, and you're, yeah. you're phoning me. Me, I know, it's crazy. Now you it's tell crazy. Adwana who you are. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> can you prove you're the bank? Yeah. No, don't bother. Yeah. Well, uh, one, of, one of mine and Stu's sort of favourite pastimes at work is when you get those cold calls where they can save you money on your electricity <coughs> or save you... Um, you know, uh, change your phone contract or all those sorts of things. And that sort of work in that role reversal back, because they've called us, you know, like I've gone into full-blown selling them a suit mode, you yeah. know, well, obviously, well, you've called here, so you want to buy a suit. So what size suit is it that you would really like yeah. to buy? I don't want a suit. Well, you must be because you've called me and I can save you money on your suit. Are you saying you don't want to save money on a suit? Or, you, uh, oh, you know, and it, oh, you're wasting my time. Thank you. <laughs> and they hang out. It's like, well, yeah, now, now, you, now you know. I mean, it's, I know they've got a job to do, but some, sometimes these people... It's are, a job that shouldn't exist. It's a, was, it is a job yeah. that shouldn't exist. I was just, yeah. You reminded me, of, I was once in Curry's, uh, and I was, they were doing some combo. This is going way back. So it was a, a DVD player and a, a, a small TV. So right. I was getting for the bedroom. And they were combining the, the, the two things. Yeah. Uh, and it was a better price. I'd seen the advert on the TV. And so I forget what the model number was or the, the, the brand name. Um, but I knew what the price was on there. So yeah. I went to Curry's. There was a young lad working there. And he went, uh, can I help you? I said, yeah. Apparently you've got a, a combination DVD and, and uh, flat screen TV. And it's, uh, if you buy them together, it's a, a cheap package. He said, oh, I don't know about that. I said, well, yeah, it's quite good, actually, because that on its own would be this much, and that would be so But if you buy the two, it's worth that. Can I help you with anything else? <laughs> and he went, he went, no, thank you. <laughs> oh, bless him. <laughs>
uh, like I said, it was cassette backing. And I'd been going on stage uh, with them and, and uh, during an instrumental number at a couple of the other gigs. They, they'd do uh, a long instrumental, I'd do my bit. But on this one, they had Michael Moorcock, the science fiction writer, was yeah. on doing a poem. So they said, well, can you come on and do it to the cassette back in between the support band and us? So what will happen is there are a Spanish heavy metal band called Baron Rocco. And uh, so they, they said they'll finish and then as the, they'll go off. As you walk forward, the safety curtain will come down behind you. Uh, you know, the big metal, yeah. the iron, as they call it. Um, and we'll reset uh, for awkward in that. As you finish your big sounds, I stood about eight or nine minutes. Um, then the curtain will go back up, dry ice rolls forward, and we're into the gig. So fine. So, so I go out and do my bit. And as I finish, uh, the cassette music runs out and the curtain doesn't go back up. And the whole thing with the iron safety curtain is it completely seals off uh, backstage right. from the, the auditorium. So I'm there also, and I've got nowhere to go. So I'm just there, there's like 5,000 bikers and hippies. And, <laughs> and <laughs> just you. I've got no microphone because um, I'm working to music back in. I've got this table there. And so then yeah, I'm just kind of stood there for a bit. And then it was, it was like Eric Morecambe at the end of the <laughs> special. <laughs> ju- ju- Get off! <laughs> yeah, jumped off the front of the stage and ran off up the aisle. Oh, so, brilliant. Uh, and ended up sleeping in my Morris Marina coupe under a stolen asbestos fire blanket. On that note, <laughs> a bombshell. On that bombshell, <laughs> we'll say thank you so much for allowing us in your home and allowing us to take up so much of your time and Not for being so generous with your time. No, it's, it's been, lovely, lovely it's talking fun. to you. <laughs> what a great chat uh, with Paul there. Once again, another guest who was so generous with their time and tea. And Paul makes a good cuppa. Uh, massive thank you to him for his time, his raconteuring and the beverages. Thanks as always to Dat Hazza for the podcast tunes, to Stuart Wilson for the editing, co-hosting and production. But no thanks at all this time for Sam because she did nothing. Until, as usual, until we speak next time, I'm your host, Stuart Hardman, and do try not to get too shirty. Yeah, uh, it's got the uh, the Banksy on the side of it with the, the kissing, kissing policeman. That's right, yeah. Uh, I, in fact, actually, I, I was in Brighton last week and we... My daughter said, oh, I've never seen a Banksy. I said, well, look, I, uh, I can well, take you there. There's a story there. Oh, about, is there? About Banksy. Um, because this is going back quite a few years. Um, but basically, someone offered to buy it. Right. Uh, this, this all came out afterwards. Um, and so one particular night, uh, in fact, no, this, going back before that, uh, someone graffitied over it. Right. Someone, and uh, so th- these really clever blokes rolled up in a, uh, in a van with a, uh, I think it was a plumber's, with their phone number on the side of it, uh, with Genius. a CCTV camera sprayed across the, the Banksy and then threw the, the cans in the bin. So they got the fingerprints, their, oh. their, their address, their yeah. telephone number, <laughs> yeah. their, their reg, everything. Um, and so they only got fined about 80 quid because you can't All really right. find someone unless you find the original graffiti artist, which would have been Banksy. Yeah, you know, so yeah, graf- yeah. Graffiti in graffiti. Um, and so anyway, that, uh, the, uh, the barman there, uh, Jez at the time, started to clean it up um, and it, it all came off, so on, on, the, on the heads of it. And so it ended up with me and him right. repainting it. Really? So we repainted that Banksy and right. then come back to where I started and someone offered to buy it. And I think it was an American company and they wanted to lift it off and send it an auction. And so the, the pub landlord sort of said, well, you can't, you know, it's a, a landmark, you can't yeah. do that. So what they did very sneakily one night, they built a, a, like a tiny shed round it overnight um, and they replaced it with an exact replica. Um, and so, oh. so the one that there is there now All is right. actually a replica Banksy. The one that got sold in the States was actually by me and Jez. <laughs> <laughs> Well, went for about half a million. Or something. <laughs> well, 
I, I'd be putting that on on my website and like you know <laughs> the the half a million pound selling artist. Yeah, yeah. And I think one of the newspapers ran with it, but um, it, it's, it's still not well known. Everybody yeah. still stops there for it. They've put perspex over yeah, it yeah. To, to to stop the replica of the replica uh, the, being the replica damaged. Replica. <laughs> oh, oh well, look, you know that's that's a that's a top story. There was a, there's a comedian called uh, Mandy Knight, and uh, she was um, uh, mad as a box of chips. Um, the I'll tell you, can we edit that bit? Mad, mad, as, mad as a bottle of chips. <laughs> uh, yeah. Box of frogs, or yeah, <laughs> let's just leave it all together. Uh, there's a there's a. Uh, there's I was a thinking that was a new phrase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, uh, it is now. Yeah. <laughs> I will be using that from now on. That's, <laughs> yeah. That will be your legacy I'm with not me. I'm heckling myself. You get, you get a box <laughs> of chips, you'll go, oh, that's mad. <laughs> a box of chips. Well, actually, all joking apart, I don't like getting a box of chips. I want them wrapped in paper. I don't want them in a box. That's madness. That is madness. Yeah. There you go. Full circle, we're quite, back. I'd quite like a bottle of chips. Um, <laughs>